Hi, Clarissa. <laughs> nice to see you here. Please go ahead with your question. Hi, Donna. Hi, everybody. Hi, Tom. Nice to be here. Okay. Here we go. Um, as I grow up, I'm able to connect with those close to me at a higher level. So I can read future probabilities from the database when conversing with them. So far, this works primarily with people I already have a close relationship with because I have background and circumstantial knowledge. Sometimes I also get the sense that they know that I know what's really going on, but it's just under their awareness, so it's not openly acknowledged. As I hone this ability, I want to be able to use it to be helpful. For example, I can see probable successful job changes and career paths, reasons for and solutions to certain health issues, and I can recognize dysfunctional relationship patterns from a mile away. But many of these things are on their path, and I'm not about to give unsolicited advice. If I'm asked a question, I try to be as positive as possible, recenter them towards a solution that they think of themselves and sometimes a helpful and careful nudge. Uh, then there are times when it's upsetting to watch people suffer, but I find that even if I do say what I see, it isn't helpful. But other times I've watered the seed that I see they've already planted themselves and they wind up in that successful probable outcome in the end after all. And of course, I'm never 100%. I'm still learning myself. But there are certain things I can see with upwards of 80 to 85% surety in my database read. So seeing those close to me succeed brings me such joy. I'm here for the friendship and the love. And I enjoy being a cheerleader for positivity. And I know that sometimes all someone needs is a friend to be with them as they walk through their wins and woes. I'm trying to approach things from a place of wisdom and authenticity. Tom, you've been answering people's big questions for many years now. What do you find is the simplest way to be helpful while also being respectful of boundaries? Cool. It's, it's, it seems that you are doing everything right. All the description you gave is exactly the way you should be doing it. You have to be careful when you are going to help people help themselves, because if they don't want it, that means they're not ready to deal with that. And you can't shove it down their throat and make them deal with it, even if you wish you could, you know, it just won't work, it'll backfire. And you, uh, from what you say, you've, you've learned that. But one of the techniques I use is that I'll offer them a, I'll ask them a question, or offer an idea that is not directly on the path of where I hope they would go, you know, where I, where I think that uh, would be most helpful to them. But it's similar. It's on the edge of that. It kind of brings it up, but not in your face brings it up. It brings it up kind of on the side a little bit, where if they want to, they can easily sidestep it. They can easily go on with something else or change the subject or whatever. It's not, uh, it's not something that forces them into a particular reply. And I let that be kind of a test to see how ready they are to head in that direction. So if I say something and uh, that kind of leads a little bit to where I'm going, but still gives them an out, if they take the out, then I leave it alone. And later I may try to say something different that would open it up. And if they take the out, then I leave it alone. And if I get two or three of those or four of those, then I just kind of leave it alone for a few weeks or a few months anyway. But that's a kind of a careful probing where they don't see it as probing. They just see it as something you're interested in or something that's just kind of, you know, gets stuck in the conversation, whatever. It has to be unobtrusive. It has to be natural. It has to just sound like part of the flow of the conversation. And if they're interested, it'll grab their attention and they'll follow it up and they'll ask more. And then you can give them a little bit more and then pique their interest a little more. And then if it if they get a little closer going in that direction, then you give them just a little bit more. You know, it's sort of like um, fishing, you know, you, uh, you have to entice them to want to delve into a particular area of understanding. And you have to lead them one small step at a time to it. And part of the problem that we often have is that we're too impatient to do that. We want them to see this particular issue 
You know, let's say you have two sisters and they fight with each other all the time and you know it's really dysfunctional. Or maybe, uh, you know, one of, your, one of your siblings argues with your mother all the time or something in the family typically like that. And you see it's so dysfunctional and you'd like to just talk to them about it, but you know if you try it directly, it isn't going to end well. So you just put these little hints out there and see if they'll pick up on it. See what they'll, where they'll go with the conversation. Get them to talk about something that's kind of in the neighborhood of where you want to go. And then let the conversation build and go. So you're dropping little bits of bait here and seeing if they'll take it. They don't take it. You can drop a little maybe better bait someplace and see if they take that. And you just keep doing that. And if they take that little piece of bait, well, then you drop another little piece of bait just a little further in that direction in front of them. So in a way, you're, you're leading, but not directly. You're leading indirectly. You're never pushing. You never uh, tell him, you know, uh, you know what it, what's they're doing wrong. You should never tell anybody what they're doing wrong anyway. That's just a, a not, you know, that's a loser to begin with. Don't start out by saying, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. That'll automatically get their ire up and make it impossible for them to listen to you. So it's always better to stay positive about that person. If it's, uh, you know, if they, let's say they always argue, uh, with somebody, you can, uh, instead of saying, well, you shouldn't argue so much, just let them be, you know, maybe that's true, but that's not what's going to help them. You can, you can talk to them from the other, part, other person's point of view. Well, I, you know, I see that uh, Susie uh, uh, said such and such, and that upset you. Well, they'll be glad to talk about that one. So then let them talk about it, and then you start filling in why maybe Susie felt that way or where she was coming from, or what her attitude was, or why she said those things that she did. So that, the other, so that then the person you're talking to sees it from a bigger picture, from Susie's viewpoint, not just the viewpoint she gets from hers. So now you've not really talked about her behavior, but her behavior comes up in that. And she can now maybe understand what that person upset her, why that person was upset, or why they maybe have said that. And so it's that sort of thing, what I mean by you bring things up that are around the conversation you'd like to have, but not the conversation you'd like to have. That has to happen organically. They have to come and ask. You know, you can't just go and tell somebody that, you know, here's what you're doing wrong and here's the way you should do it. That's just guaranteed to have a door slammed in your face when you start off that way. So that would be the technique. Let people... They have to come to it in their own, but you can encourage them to come to it. You can be part of their process of seeing bigger pictures and generally do it in a way that they are willing to pursue. Like they're willing to pursue why Susie upset them and that, that Susie's all messed up and how could she say those things? She's really, you know, they're really willing to talk about that, but you can slowly bring that around to a bigger picture. You see, so you start in a place that they, they want to go and try to make the picture bigger, wherever it is. So that's the, the kind of the, the process that I use if I've been talking to somebody, you know, and I talk to them over and over and over again. It's like somebody in a family that you do a lot of talking to. That would be the process to take. And if they just don't want to go there and they're just hard set against it, it's not ready. They're not ready yet. And if you try to push someone in a direction they're not ready to go, it will make it worse. They'll be even less ready to go after you tried to push them and they push back. It hardens their attitudes, doesn't soften them. And the thing to keep in mind is people's problems are almost never intellectual. They're never logical. They're always emotional. They're always out of the being level is where the real problem is. So if you try to explain things to them intellectually, well, look, it's not really as bad as you think. You see, you know, and you tell them, try to explain things to them. That won't work. You can't provide an intellectual solution to a being level problem. The solution just won't take. So when you're trying to help people grow, that's almost never an intellectual problem that they're having. 
It's an ego problem, a fear problem, a belief problem. And those things, they have to change themselves. So, yeah, you're doing it all right. Uh, you're you're uh, aware that you can't push, and you seem to have found a lot of success. So I say just keep up. Keep up what you're doing and find ways to be helpful in a positive way. And in general, help people see bigger pictures. You don't have to be too specific about what the picture is about. Now, their problem may be they argue too much. So you don't have to talk about arguing too much. Just see bigger pictures. And as they get bigger pictures, then they'll tend to stop arguing so much. That will change them. Got it. Yes, that's that's the perfect. That's exactly what I needed. Help them to see the bigger pictures because it's almost like a dance, and then I can feel myself like, no, don't stop, don't say <laughs> anymore, you know. But I want to keep going. And oh, come, come on, please. <laughs> um, I know it's going to be helpful when these when these kids get to those teenage years too. So, um, <laughs> thank you, Tom. Yeah, the, <laughs> it's been very helpful. Yeah, Carissa, they're, they're just kids and, and kids, know. particularly little ones, scream, fun. and it's just life. It's okay. It's not a problem. Oh, yes. Right. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. All right, Tom. Uh, Dorothea is here today, but she's asked me to read her question for you, for her. What do the preparations for an incarnation look like? Who is involved? Who chooses the family? Who determines what, what issues are worked on? Who decides who will be involved? Okay, well, it's, there's not one answer to that question. There's a lot of, you know, it depends on the individual, where they are, what state of their own evolution that they're in. Uh, there's just lots of variables. So it's kind of an individual. Everybody doesn't have the same experience. Typically, you don't know much about what the situations are to get into, right? Now, here you are, you, your old avatar died, you're looking for a new avatar, and there's, I don't know how many, uh, how many infants are, are being born, you know, every, every minute of the day, you know, every, every hour, how many infants are being born every day? There's thousands, right? Tens of thousands. Uh, so you have no idea what those situations are. That's not part of the available database for you. But so you can't say, Oh, I'd like to be a baby in that family, because you don't even know that family exists They're in some other country, some other part of the world. You know, you don't, you don't know their situation or anything. So you're pretty ignorant about making those sorts of choices. So typically, if you are in the middle region, you know, you've, you've evolved quite a bit. You're, you're in the kind of the, uh, the mid levels of this evolutionary process. You'd have some idea of what it is you need to work on because your last 20, you know, uh, avatars that you had, you had a, you saw, a, you see a similar problem in all of them. You can say, Oh, okay. I had this problem. Okay. When, you know, and, of course, you do all sorts of things. You're male, you're female, you're, you're different races, you're different economic strata, different countries, different ethnic groups, you do all that sort of thing. And you look at that and you say, well, I'm kind of having problems in this area. I need to develop more uh, confidence and uh, a more positive outlook. I tend to get into negative circles and get depressed. And that's kind of been my MO for the last case. So then you, you talk to the system and you say, well, here's my problem. Here's the issue I'd like to work on. This is the kind of thing I want. And I don't want anything that's going to exacerbate that problem. You know, I don't want something that's going to, to uh, be hard, too hard for me, and I'll fail, and then I'll be in a deeper hole. So I'd like to have something that at least I have a good shot at, and I'd you know, like to work on this kind of problem. And the system can look around over all the possibilities and pick one for you. Now, it's not an exact science, because everybody has free will. You know, when everyone has free will, what might look like a really great situation may turn out to be not such a great situation because of whatever. Okay, so it depends on 
who you are, what you need to learn, and you generally let the system make the choices for you. But now let's say you come with a very specific choice. Oh, I would like to interact with Suzy Q, my best friend. I've interacted with her a bunch of times, and she and I are really good for teaching each other things. I'm, I seem to grow more when I'm interacting with her. So I'd like to have an interaction with her. Well, that depends on whether this person is also ready to incarnate. If so, then you may be sisters, or you may live next door to each other, or you know, you maybe your mother, or your brother, or somebody else. But if she's not, then are you willing to wait? How much time are you willing to give up? See, when you give up time, you're giving up opportunities to learn. So you're kind of out of school, if you will. You're not in school. If you stay out of school too long, all you're doing is wasting time. You're not in there learning and growing. So you don't want to sit out too long, but you might. Or who knows? Maybe uh, that person you'd like to be with is already uh, in their 50s or 60s, but they've got a long time yet to go. So maybe you'd incarnate and be their, be their poodle just because you want to be real close to them, just because you like them so much, you see. And then that would be short because in 12 years you'd drive old age and, you know, they'd maybe be a little older and then maybe the times would work out pretty good for you to and them to be together. You know, who knows? See, there's all kinds of ways that you can work this and the system is generally going to work with you as best it can, but it can't always it can't ever guarantee that you'll get the situation that you want. It can only say that this looks like it's probably a good situation. And after it happens, then free will takes over and everybody acts and things happen. And who knows, you know, what, where it'll actually turn out. So for that reason, often, particularly if you were at the beginning level, there's not much thought put into it at all. You just jump in, jump out, you know, you go back in again and you take whatever's available and just let the system put you wherever you do because free will changes up everything so much anyway, it's kind of hard to plan. But then eventually you get enough experience that you realize there's certain things you'd like to work on. And you want to be mostly careful that you don't get something in that area, which is a weakness of yours, that'll be too hard for you so that you'll, you'll bomb it. You want something that'll give you more confidence, will pull you up a little bit in that area. So that's, you know, that's generally the way it works when we uh, reincarnate. There's a little planning for some people. Now for other people who have been around a lot and they've evolved a lot, they may have a very specific thing to do. It may be almost programmed. They may come to, you know, to, I don't know, do something special, do something focused because the system needs somebody to do that focused thing there. So that happens sometimes, but then that's, that's rare. That's not typical. That's way up at the, you know, 1,000th to 1% kind of thing. You know, it's a very, that's a rare thing. So it can be very um, much designed, but usually not. And at the lower end and early on, it's like no design whatsoever. And a little bit more creeps in as you as you go because you get more and more specific. So it's just it just depends on you and what you want. And if you say, I'm not ready, that last one was just traumatic. I just have to sit out for a while. That's fine too. You sit out as long as you like. Well, so thanks, does that answer Tom. your question? Does that answer your question? Was that good? Did you have a follow Dorothea? up to Yes, but that was my question. Um, that's what I thought about. Yes. Thank you very much, Tom. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Tom, her, her, her second question, which kind of ties into it is, you often mention in connection with out-of-body experiences that consciousness is not in the body. How does the connection from our consciousness to our body arise? I assume that we somehow commit ourselves to the body. And then tying into that, is this process related to the autonomous phase of young children? Uh, before the autonomous phase, we, we talk about ourselves in the third person. And she'd like to know whether, um, and that comes 
come, comes later, mm -hmm. we talk about ourselves in the first person. Is there a connection there? I think it's an interesting um, question. Yeah. No, I think this, uh, this autonomous age, as you, as you mentioned, I don't think there's any connection to that. I suspect, now I don't know, you know, it's not a place where I have studied, but I suspect that's more of a language issue than anything else. You know, mom and dad call her Susie. So she just refers to herself as Susie. Susie is thirsty because that's what she's called. So that's her name and that's what she calls herself. I is a little more abstract, you know, referring to self, not just a name. There's a difference between a name and a I, but it's a little more, you have to have a little better grasp of language before the I becomes a concept that you can really work with. Typically children first just name things. They just learn in vocabulary. So I think that's a, it's kind of a standalone, but what happens, um, you know, we have a, a, a individuated unit of consciousness and you've probably heard me say it, it uh, partitions off a piece of itself and it, we call that the free will awareness unit. And that free will awareness unit, I say, logs on to the avatar. Now, what does that mean, logs on to the avatar? Well, the avatar doesn't really exist. There is no avatar. Now, I know that's hard. Wait a minute, here it is, I'm the avatar. What do you mean there's no avatar? You know, see this guy here, that's the avatar. But that avatar is just computed. This is a virtual reality. The avatar doesn't actually exist. So just like if you log on to your elf in some game where it has elves in it, where the elves run around and do things, and you log on to that particular elf, and that's your elf, and you play that elf every time you play that game. Well, it's that thing. That's the same thing. You log on. What that means is you make an agreement with the, with the rendering engine, with the computer, with the larger conscious system, that it will send you a data stream that shows you all the sight, sound, touch, smell that that avatar has. All their sense data will come to you because the computer's gonna compute what that avatar sees. You know, my elf looks this way, it sees a tree, looks that way, it sees a lake, looks up ahead, it sees a rock. And that data is sent to you and you get it on your computer and as your elf turns his head around, you get to see the, the lake, the rock, you know, the, the trees. You get to see those things. Okay, so the computer sends you what the sense data of your avatar would see, hear, smell, taste, touch. So that's what you get. Now in your mind, you see this picture of your little, you know, blue elf with these long pointy ears and whatever. You see that picture and you see the picture of all the other players in there. That picture helps you understand the game and what's going on and how you interact with others. So that's the virtual reality, but that doesn't actually exist. There is no elf. There's just a computation of an elf. And there is no Dorita or Tom Campbell or Donna either. That's just the computer computes those avatars. What there is is consciousness. So your IUOC partitions off a piece of itself and it says, all right, that little piece, you represent me, what I've learned and the entropy that I've, you know, that I've lost up to this point. You, that's represents me. Now you go get the data stream for that character and you just log on. You say computer server of the virtual reality. I'm now going to play this character. So give me the sense data of all the things that that character sees and does, and I will make all of its choices. And that's how that works. So it's just a, you know, in a virtual reality, there's, there's not the computer, the virtual reality and the player, the virtual reality really doesn't exist. There's just a the computer and the player. That's all that's really real. So that's what log on is. It's just that simple. There is no connection to the avatar. The avatar doesn't exist. The player exists and the player makes all the choices. And the, the avatars are drawn or computed and drawn to just show the player what's going on. You know, how their avatar is doing, how they're interacting with other things and other people and, and so on. It just gives the player a sense of what's happening, how their choices are playing out in this virtual reality. So um, that's how you log on. You just, it's, a, it's an agreement with the uh, computer to get that data stream. So, okay, you, you say, oh, all right, my, my avatar died. I'm looking for a new avatar. 
here's the kind of things I'd like to learn and the, the things I'd like to be. I've been a really hard time here being uh, what I'm being. So I need to do that again because I, I need to get better at that. And then the system says, all right, here's a choice. I think this is a good one for you. Would you like to go with that? And you say yes. And then bingo, you go to the server and say, okay, server, from now on, send that entity's sense data to me and I'll make all the choices. So thank you very much, Tom. Um, about the location, if you could say location, um, is my consciousness then in NPMR and I stay there and I just log in there? Yeah, that would be one way to that would be one way to say it. That would be a good metaphor. You live in the non-physical in NPMR. This physical reality doesn't actually exist. It's a virtual reality. What's real is consciousness. What's real is consciousness. That's a real thing. The virtual reality is something that's computed. So yes, you are a piece of consciousness. You're a part of this larger consciousness system. And we, we here from the viewpoint of us avatars, we see that as non-physical out there in non-physical matter reality. Because what's physical to us is the virtual reality. That's what's physical to us. So the computer is non-physical, the player is non-physical, the larger conscious system is non-physical. Those are all outside. So it's the same way with the computer game. My little blue elf running around in that particular game, from its viewpoint, that virtual reality is physical. That rock, that tree, that lake is physical. But the player, me, is non-physical. And the computer that's serving it isn't in that virtual reality. The computer is non-physical to that elf. So that's just the nature of, of virtual reality, that it, works, that it works that way. So yes, you are in... And PMR, you're in the, from our viewpoint, you're in the non-physical, just a piece of the larger system. Thank you very much. All right, um, Guillaume has a question and I see your, your friend with you there. He's getting anxious, so please go ahead. <laughs> Hello there, uh, do you, is the sound okay? Yes, I think so. Okay, thanks. Uh, Tom, my question is about um, a kind of uh, education in general, uh, but uh, I heard you talk uh, a bit about the system uh, of uh, school and education in the past few years here in Fireside Chat, but uh, could you talk more a bit about uh, the role of teacher around the world? Uh, I mean, uh, kind of a primary or high school teacher, uh, like, uh, working with children uh, all day long. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's kind of a, an important uh, way to uh, spread love and awareness and uh, educate people to uh, kind of <laughs> going uh, to a path of lowering their entropy. So um, just simply, could you just talk about uh, this, um, um, this kind of work and how, a teacher, you are a teacher, a teacher presently, uh, 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 we are all learning something, but how uh, can you be uh, like, uh, there's a um, um, Zen monk, Tishnatan, that say that happy teachers uh, can uh, change the world. So I guess uh, how can teacher uh, can more easily in his way of being change the world? Okay. Yes, teaching is a, you know, a very important profession. And as you, as all of us know, who've been in school, there are some good teachers and there's some really bad teachers, you know, you run into, you run into both of those. And I think the things that a teacher is talking about teaching in general, and this is true, whether you're teaching kindergarten or whether you're teaching adults, is that teaching is not effective if you come from the position of, I know, you don't, just be quiet and listen. You know, if that's, if that's your attitude, then you will not be a good teacher. 
some teachers have that attitude. In that case, you're saying, I'm big, you're small. <laughs> Just, you know, be quiet and do what I say. Learn the things I want you to learn. And you're kind of running over everybody in your class's free will. You're not letting them be them. You are um, pushing this information at them and telling them that they have to accept it and, and uh, learn it. That's a very ineffective teacher. Teachers need to be aware that their students are, you know, pieces of consciousness, individuated units of consciousness or free will awareness units that have free will, have attitudes, have needs, have ideas, have egos, have beliefs, that they have all these things and you need to treat them as, as individual entities that are important all in themselves. If you have them in a big class, if you have one teacher and you have 30 or 40 kids in that class, and because you can't treat each one as an individual, you basically, you know, uh, have to talk to all of them at the same time. Well, now it's hard to be individual with them. You just say things and you hope that most of them get it. Some of them will, some of them won't. You just move on. And that's the way it is. Well, that's also not a very good model of teaching. Teaching is done much better if it's one on one. It's done much better if it's one on three or four. You know, it depends on what grade we are. You know, if you're at a very low grade, then the one on one works better than if you're at a higher grade where the one on maybe 10 or 15 can work all right. But depends on what you're doing. You go to college and graduate school and maybe it's one on you know 50 and that's okay too. So it depends on that situation, but you have to look and accept the basic humanity of every student and that they are important and that they come from different places, different attitudes. Some of them will understand what you say and some of them just won't because the words you use won't be familiar to them. You know, they just won't get it. The concept won't be familiar to them. And you start your lecture with an assumption that everybody has these basic understandings and will work from there. And for the most part, that's not true. Everybody doesn't have those basic understandings. That's why people get confused. So teaching is a hard thing to do in the, in the, what, the, the model that we have. You know, we have a lecture model, right? Where the teacher stands up and tells the kids what it is they're supposed to know. That's extremely inefficient. When the children go to that, they don't see themselves as going to school to learn. They see themselves as being incarcerated for, you know, four or five hours a day, being force fed stuff that other people want them to know. That's the way they see that. That's what makes it such a terrible way of teaching. If you work with children, you'll find that they're eager to learn. They're really eager to learn. And if you can work with that eagerness, then they will learn very quickly. If you regiment them, and spoon feed them and regurgitate this on the test, they won't learn much of anything except how to make good grades on tests. They'll learn how to memorize and regurgitate, but won't actually be able to think. And that's not what we want. Now, teaching adults is different. If it's a very specific subject, like you're teaching them arithmetic or to read or something like that, then you need to be very patient and you need to deal with the whole person, not just deal with them intellectually, because you have to deal with their fears, their lack of uh, uh, confidence, these sorts of things, because those are going to be the things, if you're now 40 years old and you haven't yet learned to read, you probably have some pretty negative feelings about yourself and you feel like you're behind and you, you're not up to snuff and you failed and you have, and you have to deal with all that. If you come on too hard, you'll just, and push too much on them, they'll just, it'll emphasize those fears and they'll retreat and you'll never teach them anything. So you always have to teach the whole person, which means their feelings, their attitudes, their perspectives, and you have to make it fun. People learn when they're having fun. It can't be a, here's the lesson for today, you know, commit it to memory. That is not a 
good way to teach either. So teaching is challenging in that you may have a lot of knowledge, but to communicate to someone, you have to start from where they are. You can't start from where you are. You must start from where they are. You have to say things that they understand and then lead them step by step to new things, the new things that you understand better than them. If you try to start from where you are and figure, well, sink or swim, kids, you know, you're all, you know, you either get it or you won't, and I really don't care. I'm just up here to tell you the way it is. Then again, you'll be a very poor teacher. That's not a good teacher. But if you are assigned a class and you have 50 people in your class, that's what it amounts to. It'll turn into something like that, and there's not too much you can do about it. So we don't really teach very well in most of our schools and situations. If you tell somebody something they're not yet ready to process, it won't be helpful to them. If you tell them things, you know, if you have to first learn A so that you can understand B, and you have to understand B before you can understand C, and if you start right off with somebody and you talk to them about C, they just won't get it. You'll confuse them. You'll make them feel less capable. You'll, you'll tear away their confidence. You have to be careful not to tell people things they're not ready for. That will damage them. Just tell them the things they are ready for at the level they're ready for it. And once they show you that they're ready for that, then you can teach them some other things. One step at a time. So that's what I mean by saying you have to go to where they are. It can't be just about you. You're the subject matter expert, and you're going to lay out all the facts of your subject matter, and they, go, they will get it or not get it. It's up to them. Well, that's what most schools are like. But that's not the way you really can teach people. That's not the best way to teach people. And it's usually not all that satisfying to teach people. I taught a lot of people, and that's what I did when I was in graduate school. All those many years, I was on a teaching assistantship. So I taught undergraduate classes of all sorts of things. And uh, I enjoyed it. But all I needed to really enjoy it was if I had at least one or two students that really wanted to learn. And if I just, just had a couple of students, even one was enough, who really wanted to learn, then that made it worth my while to go there. I enjoyed it. I could walk in that room and, and I was teaching, but I was mostly just teaching to that one kid. That's all. The rest of them were just there because they had to be there. They weren't really there. But if I had a class where nobody was interested, it's like I had to drag myself into that class to teach. That was just so uninteresting, so, so nothing. You know, I didn't want to be there. So that's all it takes. It's just one student who really cares, and, you know, that'll light up a teacher. They don't need, they don't ask for a lot. You know, that'll light up most any teacher, just have somebody that really wants to learn. But teaching is a tough job because first you have to understand your student, where they're coming from, what they know, what they don't know. And if you got 20 students, that's really tough because there's a big range of things that they know and that they don't know. So this makes it very difficult to be a good teacher. So unfortunately, we make, we have structures in our schools that make being a good teacher really, really hard. But that's just the way we do things. So it's hard to be a good teacher in our, in our schools. And that's true whether it's college or kindergarten or graduate school you know it's hard to be a good teacher in those in those situations because the school is not really there for the student the school is there for its own sake the professors are there for their own sakes they're doing research or they're doing this or they're doing that but they're getting paid to show up and they're there for themselves and the idea of the students are just the people who pay the bills and you have to you have to give them so many hours of lectures and that's it. And when a school gets that kind of an attitude, then it's hard to, you know, for most of the students to do very well. The, the student has to be the, the center, the focus. It has to be about them. And you have to care about them, and they'll get that. And if you don't care about them, they'll get that too. And they won't care about what you're trying to tell them. So 
education is an is a very important thing. I mean, knowledge knowledge is ter- is wonderful. Knowledge is great, but shared knowledge is much much better. So if there's something that you know, sharing that with others will take that knowledge and spread it around to maybe a hundred people. That's powerful. That's important. And doing that in a way that 100 people can get it, that's important to give thought to that and to try to be as inclusive as possible. So, Gil and me, I, I'd say teaching is important, one of the most important things we do, but you have to think a lot about when you go into that. You have to think a lot about how you can optimize that, make it about the students, and uh, you know, go to the extra effort to help them learn interesting example when I was a graduate student I taught in uh, one of some of the classes I taught were problem sessions you know in the physics department you have lab you have problem sessions and then you have regular lectures well I was teaching problem sessions and I would work out all the problems ahead of time that was before there was such things as Xerox machines they had mimeograph where you'd scratch on a piece of paper and run it through a wet solution and it would come out with purple letters it was a real lengthy process but the ladies at the office always uh, did that for me and i would do mimograph so i'd make like i had 20 kids in a class so i'd make like 20 copies and before we'd start i'd hand them all the solutions to all the problems and say now you don't have to copy it off the board just listen to me i'm going to explain it to you you don't have to write it down it's already written down everything i'm going to say is already written down in your hands so just listen i'm going to explain it and try to make it make sense And what happened was, is that after about three weeks, I had 50 kids in my classroom. They were standing up all along the walls. They were out in the hallways looking in. And I was making like 50 and 60 copies of this this handout. And um, it got to to the point that they just couldn't cram any more people in or stand in the hall and got to be a nuisance. But uh, because they could learn so much more if they weren't sitting there trying to copy things down, if they could just pay attention, and if they could see how the problem worked. So nobody else did that because, you know, it wasn't really about the kids. It was about them doing what they had to do to get paid. So that's just an example. You know, if you give kids an opportunity, this is my point, if you give kids an opportunity to learn, they'll fill up your room. They'll stand in the halls to learn. If you make it really hard for them, well, they'll get by the best way they can. So all you have to do with kids is make it easy for them to learn, make it fun for them to learn, and shoot, they will stay there as long as you can endure just picking your brains and learning. So I think everybody likes to learn. Everyone kind of has this this idea they need to learn, they need to grow. It's just part of us, the way we are. And if you can tap into that, wow, you can be a really good teacher and they'll, your students will learn lots and lots of stuff. But it's mostly one-on-one is the most effective way to teach. And that's just impractical in a system like ours. That was a um, wonderful story, Tom. That's, um, <laughs> did you have a comment on that, Guillaume? Or, um... uh, nice insight of course uh, but um, um but thank you <laughs> thank you thank you too i won't have um, anything all right um tom we've got two more questions are you are you up for it or absolutely okay let's go carolyn always have time for carolyn oh that's sweet thank you <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to know how your life changed once you discovered the power of intent, like that uh, once you got rid of the belief that you have to do something to make something happen and um, how much time we need to invest into the intent if we want to practice it ourselves and get rid of that belief ourselves. And um, then how can we use it to provide value for people other than healing them and sending them like good vibe okay well first one is how did your life change once you discovered the power of intent and 
I don't know that that was a discovery that just one day was an aha moment. I think that kind of discovery was something that, that pulled itself together over years. But I think the way I approached that was when I realized that the consciousness is really a very powerful thing and that you can modify future probability and change the way things happen. And when I, when I got to that realization, my reaction to it was, well, if my mind modifies future probability, then I need to make sure that my mind is doing the right thing and thinking the right thoughts. Because I'm, you know, I'm changing probabilities here. So it put on, to me, it put a, a much larger stress on growing up. Because I'm helping create this reality. And my thoughts are part of the you know, part of the the, uh, the reason why things are the way they are, all our thoughts are. So it made me feel a lot more responsible for what I was thinking. And I realized that, you know, I had to grow up. I had to get rid of, uh, you know, ego or thoughts that were not productive and not useful because that was just pulling not only me, but everybody else down too. You know, it was, uh, it just made the whole social system work less well. So I think that was my first reaction to that, is that I saw it as a as a, I had to be more responsible and make sure that my thoughts were effective and productive and positive, and that uh, I didn't cause problems for others because of my thinking. And for some reason, probably just because it wasn't who I was, I never got into the I never got into the idea. Oh, I could manifest things. I can make things happen. You know, I can, uh, you know, start putting energy into having more money in my bank account and things like that. It just never occurred to me to, to even think those thoughts. I didn't, uh, I didn't do any of that at all as far as trying to modify my reality with my thinking, other than the fact that I did uh, practice healing some. That would affect other people, but that was only when, when I asked or when I was just practicing and playing, uh, but I was careful with that. So that was the big change. It made me feel more responsible because I was part of a larger thing. It wasn't just me. You know, I was part of something bigger. I got that same lesson when uh, the, the state that I was in passed a law that said everybody riding a motorcycle had to wear a motorcycle helmet. My first reaction was, oh, that's unfair. You know, it's my head. My head gets busted open. It's my head. Don't tell me what I can do with my head. You know, don't tread on me. And I had that, but that's a child's reaction. And later I realized, well, no, it's not just me. You know, when I bounce my head on the street and I end up in the hospital and I require, uh, you know, what, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to try to put all the pieces together again. And then if they don't all go together, I require a lot of help with my artificial, you know, limbs or my this or my that and the, the, the maybe the neuro, uh, the neuro deficiencies I might have because of the damage to the brain and I could be costing the society literally hundreds of millions of dollars because of my not wearing a helmet. I think that gives the society a right to tell me to wear a helmet. So then I changed my mind. But it's a similar kind of thing rather than thinking the self centered picture. Oh, what's does that have to do with me? You know, oh, I can make money with my intent or, you know, I don't need to wear a helmet. That's very self-centered thinking. It's all about you. <laughs> you know, the rest of the world take care of itself, but that's all about you. And that was my, uh, that was the same kind of thing I had with intent. Just more responsibility. How much time do we need to invest in the intent to, order to create results, that depends on the results you're trying to create. Some things are going to be easier and harder than others. Trying to heal someone, if you work on that healing, I'd say four or five, six times a day, you just revisit it and give it a little nudge, and you do that for two weeks, you probably has done as much as you're going to do. If you try it any more, it probably wouldn't make much difference. You could do two or three times that much and it would probably only make your result maybe one or two percent better. In other words, you get to the point that there's, you know, no, no return on further or very little return on further effort. So there are limits. If you were trying to uh, 
or increase the amount of money in your bank account. Now that may take, uh, you know, some months or years to have that. But what that actually does is when you have that intent, if you really want to do that, then it makes you act in ways that help that happen. If you just want to magically make money appear in your bank account because you'd like to be richer, that probably just won't work at all. You can work on that probably forever and not, not make that happen. But if you just want to be on more industrious so that you have more resources to spend, then you can probably make those adjustments if you have an intention to do so. So it's not magic. This using your intent, it's just your intent modifies future probability. It doesn't magically make things happen or go away. And the last one is how can we use it to provide value to, to people other than healing them? Well, you can have an intention that isn't specific, like I want to heal this person's broken arm or make that healing take place quicker so that they only have to wear that cast and it'll only be a problem for only two months instead of the six months that it would be otherwise, make it heal quicker. You can do that, that's very specific, but you can do things that are more general. Like you can use your intent to make people kinder, make people see bigger, helps people see bigger pictures, help people relax and let go of some of their fears. You can do those kinds of general things for people that isn't really healing a specific thing, but helping them just the same. And you can do that with yourself too. You know, you can heal yourself. It doesn't have to be just on others. If you're feeling particularly tense or anxious or upset about a particular thing, you can send yourself energy that just says, relax, let go, back up, take a, take a breather, you know, and, and uh, let this rest for a while. Come back to it tomorrow. That's helpful to you. It's helpful to other people if you give them that. You can just give somebody a whole lot of energy, just fill their their light body up with energy and just say, do with this whatever you want. Use it for anything you want. I love you. Here's a bunch of energy. Do anything you want with it. So there's lots of things like that you can do to be helpful to other people. You can uh, use your intent to understand what those people want and need so you can be better at helping them find that, understand their 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 beliefs and their their fears and their their ego so that you can interact with them more successfully, so that you can teach them more easily, more successfully. So you can use it for all sorts of things. You know, when when you folks ask me questions, sometimes you see Sometimes my eyes will kind of drift shut and open back up again and other things. I do that. I, I collect data from what, you, what, what are you really asking? You know, what's, the, what's the real problem there and what is it can I tell you? And if I tell you that, what should I not say because 100,000 people might look at this one day and I don't want to do any damage in the process of helping you. So I have all that stuff and it all jumbles around and out comes something. You know, and I don't necessarily tell you everything I know about it because I think maybe you're not ready for that yet but I have to get that from you. And I'm careful that, that there may be other people who are not ready that would do damage to them. Well, then I have to say it some other way because I don't wanna say things that help one person and hurt somebody else. And I also know that I can't be positive for everybody all the time. Sometimes I'm gonna say things that some people will take out of context and it'll be negative for them. I can't help that either, but I try to minimize it. So I have all those thoughts going on in my head as I make up words to, to uh, talk to you about. And I, in order to do that, I have to connect with you, see where you're at, where your thoughts are. Because if I tell you something you're not ready to process, it won't do either one of us any good. So that's, that's how you can use these, these skills, you know, to be helpful to other people. So that uh, answer your question, Caroline? So can I imagine it just like a, like a moment, like a, like if you, like the intent, the time you invest into the intent, is it just like? It depends on how good you are at, at clearing your mind, and getting rid of the of the you know having that what we talked about earlier the uh, discipline. If your mind is well disciplined, and if you can have a, a very sharp focus on what you want to do 
And if you can put a lot of your own energy behind it, and you can do that quickly, then 10 seconds may be plenty. If you can't, if, you're noisy, if your mind is noisier, your discipline isn't so good, your thoughts are a little fuzzy, um, you might work on it for, you know, a half an hour, an hour to get the same result that you could get in the 10 seconds. It kind of depends on, on you. But every little bit helps. If you're just letting somebody feel better and relax and see a bigger picture, just giving them an I love you pile of energy, they can do anything they want. You can do that generally pretty quickly. But since you can do it quickly, then you can also do it often. So if it only takes 10 seconds, gee, you could do that 10 times in a day, easily. That was very, very helpful. Thank you very much, Tom. You're welcome. Tom, are you okay to take one more question? Absolutely. Ash has, all right, Ash has been waiting patiently. Thank you very much. I know you condensed your question a little bit, so give it a shot. <laughs> Nice to see everyone again. Um, my question today is fairly similar uh, to ones I've asked in the past, but I've kind of uh, maybe I'm asking it in a different manner, but uh, basically, okay. So if our purpose here is to grow up and become love and love is about other and being helpful and positive, should our focus be uh, on the collective state of the world, and in parentheses, I have after we ourselves kickstart growth and compassion within ourselves, because obviously, well, you know, two two people who have uh, read your work and know a little bit about the community that your personal growth is where everything starts. But once we've kind of started doing that for a little bit, done the five or ten years of uh, continuous effort then uh, should it be on the collective state of the world? And then I go on to say, if uh, tomorrow no more children were getting kidnapped, et cetera, because people who are making free will choices to kidnap them were either no longer choosing to do so because they understood why not to by themselves or were in therapy because they chose to or were in therapy potentially by force if they wouldn't um, and just kind of keep going to where you get to a point where the end result was access to safety, food, water, shelter, and education for all, would that be growing towards love? And if yes, then I have a pretty good idea of the model and uh, the logic mm -hmm. that you use I'm following. If no, then I think a lot of people just like me would benefit from an exact course of action, and I'm careful to use these words because I know that it's not about acting the part, it's about actually being that, but a course of action to take given the environment we are in, if our goal is to minimize suffering and maximize learning, growing, and lowering entropy. So to clarify, personally, I feel at peace and I'm happy. And a uh, big reason for that is you, Tom, and the community, everybody here. Um, and uh, you always say, help the best you can and go to where they are. And mm -hmm. my one and only uh, current struggle currently is that uh, one that like just takes my attention away from uh, studying reality, my, you know, true interest um, is the suffering of others. And I want to make sure that I understand the proposed model, therefore offer love. Um, just like Tom and your grandson, I remember you talking about that you guys did a if X then Y model of morality. And the last little bit here is uh, to conclude to just like make sure I get my point across. If uh, if a group of 100 monkeys are on an island with 1,000 banana trees and no other food, and two monkeys build a fence around all the banana trees and use sharp sticks and stones to only allow monkeys that do things for them, like tend the banana trees or tend the fence or mm -hmm. make more sticks and stones to eat bananas, if a monkey from the general population wants to become love and cares for the well-being, safety, and happiness potential of every monkey, should they, A, just kind of pipe down, help with one of the banana obtaining tasks and in their day to day, be as positive and loving and caring to everyone that happens to come to, 
you know, come across them? Or B, should they work towards an island where either through understanding or whatever means necessary, no monkey has control of another's access to bananas? Okay. Yeah, we talked about that a bit when Marla uh, asked her question. And, you know, it's this this difficult uh, decision as to are you at the place where force is the right thing to do, where force is the low entropy solution. And again, my, my uh, MBT model is not a pacifist model. You know, it does allow force to be played, but only in very special circumstances. For the most part, force creates a bigger problem. Uh, for instance, in your world of monkeys, let's say you had the, you know, all, all the monkeys on are outside, the, outside the, uh, the little fort that the two that have all the bananas. So let's say that what happens is that uh, everybody gets so worked up that they tear down the fence and they go in there and they, you know, kill the two monkeys that were there and then they, everybody wants to take care of the take charge of the bananas themselves everybody else wants to be the one that owns all the bananas so they get in a big fight and by the time it's all done there aren't any monkeys left they all just because they all were a low quality of consciousness everybody had greed everybody had ego everybody had a lot of beliefs everybody thought that uh, they wanted all the bananas then of course you end up with a very high uh, situation and that would not have been a very good thing to do it didn't end up well. Right. So you see, you have to take each, each situation has to be, has to be worked out by itself. You know, you have to work it out as it works. Of course, the best thing in that monkey example is that the other monkeys try to uh, reason with the two that are in charge. They try to explain things to them. They try to show that if they all work together, they could do better than if, you know, just two are in charge of running the uh, free will of the others, right? That that's a suboptimal situation, that everybody would be better off through cooperation. Now, if they could convince them of that, well, then that would take place and it would all be just uh, educational and it wouldn't be any violence necessary. Um, people could uh, do like Gandhi did, they could do a nonviolent resistance and just refuse to do any work. And then the two monkeys would have a whole bunch of bananas, but they wouldn't have anything that they wanted as far as the work done. And of course, I guess those bananas would only last so long. So, you know, in, another, in a week, they'd all be rotten. You know, so most of the bananas would just rot and nothing, no value would be uh, had in them. So there's lots of, see, we could go through and make a hundred scenarios about that and every one of them would be different. So you can't just make a basic idea that if things aren't the way you want them, you should go in with guns blazing and fix them. That's wrong. That isn't the way to do it. You cannot impose your sense of what's right on everybody else. Then you're overrunning other people's free will. So you always approach those situations with as low an entropy solution as you can. You always work it that way. You know, and then you get to a point where you decide whether force is going to actually create a worse situation or a better situation. Okay. Now, if you had the idea that all the monkeys there, except for those two that grabbed all the bananas, if everybody there was a very high quality consciousness monkey, they were all full of love and peace except those two, all right, then a good point might be made for forcing those two to give up their bananas because they were all going to rot in a couple of days anyhow, you know, and everybody gets something to eat. But if that wasn't the case, if most of those monkeys were just like average monkeys, just like those two, they just didn't happen to get there first. <laughs> they didn't have the idea. Well, then forcing it is not going to work. It's just going to create a bigger mess when you're done. It's going to, it's going to make it all worse. So it depends on the quality of the people. I mean, everybody can shake their fist at the, you know, at the CEOs and the bankers and the politicians and go, ah, oh, these are the evil people that are messing everything up in the world. But basically, that's not really true. If you took all those people out of those powerful positions and just randomly selected people from the world and put them in those positions, chances are it would be just about the same. Wouldn't change much, you see. 
Those people are not the problem. Those people are a symptom of the problem. They are abusing other people because they have the power to do so, and they make more money if they abuse people. That's a symptom of the problem. The problem is a low quality of consciousness. And if everyone else had a higher quality of consciousness, those two, those, those low quality executives and politicians that you're thinking of, they would all just melt and go away. They'd change, they'd grow up too, because everybody else was grown up. They couldn't, they couldn't persist. They can only persist in their greed because most of us are just like them. <laughs> we support it. We're just like them. So most people are. So for the most part, when you have a lot of ungrown people, storming the ramparts doesn't really help much. It just typically tends to make things worse. But there could be exceptions. You know, it just depends. Every situation's different. It's all, everyone's different and has to be looked at. So the thing to do is think about a problem that you have a choice in. You know, you can't, you can't, uh, you know, charge the ramparts all by yourself. <laughs> you know, uh, an assault of one doesn't do much. But think about the things you can do. What can you do by yourself? And then, yes, it comes to where you can improve the quality of your own consciousness. You can try to educate. You can try to help other people see problems. You can help other people grow up. Because if they don't grow up, but just intellectually see the problem, it's still not going to work. You know, if you put those random people in those powerful positions, and, and then, I don't know, every 10 years, put 10 more random, you know, put more random people in there, it wouldn't be any better. And in the long run, it would just be the way it is now. So we have to not focus on fixing symptoms. We have to focus on, on fixing problems. Because if you don't fix the problem, that symptom is just going to re-exert itself in some other form, some other way. It's just going to come back. And you haven't really done anything. Notice our civilization. Look at humans over the last, uh, you know, what, 5,000 years. Well, we've been in a control power force, right? That's the... That's, that's what buys things. That's the coin of the realm, control, power, force. And we've been that way. We have not been very grown up. Oh, sure, there's few of us grown up every time, all ages, every millennia, every century, there's people who get it. But the most don't. Most are kind of just like they're, you know, like those leaders are. So we've had those same problems. The people in charge abuse the people who, you know, who aren't in charge, the people with power abuse the people that don't have power. And so on, it's gone year after year, civilization after civilization. It was like that when it was just a few tribes walking around. It's like that when there were, you know, castles on top of hills. It was like that in the industrial age. It's like that now. You figure we, we've been growing up, but just little bits. If we look at our culture now and our society, it's much better than it was 500 years ago, much better. 500 years ago, life was cheap. If you were one of the powerful people and there was somebody that wasn't, you could just, you know, kill them for fun, just because you wanted to see if you could shoot an arrow straight. You wanted a human target. You could do that and nobody would give you a problem about that because you could, because you had the power and they didn't. Well, life's not like that now. In general, we've grown up a lot but we still have a long ways to go. And we're still in that thrall of control, power, force. But for the first time ever in the life of humanity, we have chances to make big, big changes. But those big changes aren't going to come because all the good guys go kill all the bad guys. That's just going to give us another whole set of bad guys. It's not going to work. They're going to come because people get the idea that love is the answer, that cooperation is what's going to change the world, that peace and working with people and giving respect to all other you know, living things, that that is the solution. And that those people live it, not only see it intellectually, but they live it. And they talk about it. That's the solution, because that will last. Because if you took all the bad people in the world and put them all in jail, there'd still be a problem. 
you'd have half the, you know, you have three quarters, you'd have three fourths of the population in jail, <laughs> and the other force would have to feed them all. You know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's just not going to work. Those kinds of solutions, those, those solutions that depend on force just don't work. And eventually, all those people in jail would find a way to get out. They'd break the jail down or something. They would somehow get out, and then you'd be worse off. So now you'd have all those bad people with vengeance you know, on their mind. So it just doesn't work. Trying to fix symptoms is the wrong way to go about being part of the solution. So work on solving the real problem, not just the symptoms. Don't worry about the symptoms. Now, what that does, it means you have to have, you have to be grown up enough that you can let people be and realize, all right, those people are very high entropy. They haven't grown up yet. They have a lot of lessons you have to learn, but they will learn them eventually, but they're just, they, where they are, wherever they are in their, in their evolution, there they are. Some of them just happen to end up with power. Some of them, most of them don't have any power. The ones that have power tend to take advantage of the ones that don't. Well, that's just the way our world is. We've grown up a lot, but we still have further to go. So you don't you know, hate those people. Or you don't want to get them and kill them. You don't want to throw them in jail. You want to teach them. You want to show them a better way. And you can't teach anybody anything until they're ready to learn it. If you grabbed all those people and said, okay, guys, you're enforced, be a nice person school. We're going to take all of you. We're going to teach you to be a nice person. We're going to sit here and we're going to just go over it and over until you get it as long as it takes to make you a nice person. It's not going to work. You can't do that. They can grow into that nice personhood as they grow up from the inside out. And if you try to push on them and force them, you'll make them go the opposite direction. It'll make everything worse. You see, now you've got a lot of people that you forced to go through nice person school, and all of them now are full of more hate and more negativity than they were before because you forced them to go through this process, and they didn't want to. You ran over their free will. Now they're all angry. It's worse off than it was before. You see, and you can't teach anybody something. You can't make somebody grow up just by lecturing to them. They have to do it on their own. So you look out at the world and say, world, you're really dysfunctional. There's a lot of dysfunctional people out there, but that's the way it is. Now, I have to be positive amongst all that dysfunction. I need to stay positive. I need to smile. I need to be happy, find peace, find joy, and live with it. In other words, I need to deal with what I find out there. And I need to change it as I can, which means help people grow up, not shove my way down their throat. So that's... That's kind of the answer to when do you use force? Seldom. Sometimes, yes, but be very careful that the force isn't making your ego feel better. So you can jump up and down and say, yeah, we got them. We got those bad guys, and it makes me feel great. That's just your ego. That's nothing important. That's just your ego. So you have to make sure that if violence is the answer, you've thought it out very carefully. And then you look at the results and see, did that actually turn out in the long term to be better or worse? Well, because thank of you, what Tom. I did. Thank you very much. We'll have to end on that note. And thank you, Ash, for your questions and all of you. I hope we see you again at the next session. I and MBT Events hope you liked this video. We will continue to post videos for free on my YouTube channel, but please understand, these videos are expensive to produce. They represent many thousands of hours of production and editing, as well as all the necessary audiovisual equipment, computers, and software. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. It would be very much appreciated. The links are in the description below. Thank you.